Greetings and welcome back to room 303. We are in Senior English A. Our hymnals are open to page 511. Let's just remind ourselves of where we've been. If you want to backtrack in your hymnals for just a second to 506, 507. We are looking at three titles that all share in common the idea of that carpe diem theme. If you turn back even one page further to 504, under literary analysis, you will see that carpe diem theme. Let's go ahead and put this in our notes at to be just to remind ourselves one more time what the carpe diem, carpe diem theme is. Horace, the great Roman writer, had said it, carpe diem, seize the day. In other words, take your chance. In other words, go for it. Now, in both Marvel's Coy Mistress, as well as Robert Herrick's To the Virgins to Make Much of Time, it is a very simple message. Seize the day means for the guy to go for the girl and for the girl to allow the guy to go for her. In other words, these poems, as we've said in a previous lecture, very, very sexual in their orientation. Notice again on page 510, it is not to the virgin, but to the virgins to make much of time. That is to say, we want to convince all virgin girls that they should not sit around and wait, but rather should actually seize the day, meaning here, of course, have as much sexual experiences as one can, as young as one can. A, a bit controversial, as we've said. We now turn to, on page 511, Sir John Suckling. Suckling, notice his date, 1609 to 1642. Let's read really quickly the brief biography information that they give to us there. In some ways, are you reading with me? Page 511, page 511. In some ways, Sir John Suckling lived a life more romantic than Marvel's or Herrick's, the two poets that we've just pre previously studied. A privileged young courtier, Suckling inherited his vast estates when he was only 18. He later served as a gentleman in the privy chamber of Charles I. Praised as the cleverest of conversationalists, Suckling was said to be able to compose a poem at a moment's notice. He incorporated some of his best lyrics, including the poem Song, the one we are going to look at into plays, that he lavishly produced at his own expense. Suckling's military exploits proved less successful than his poems, however. The cavalry troop he raised and lavishly uniformed for the king was defeated in Scotland, and Suckling was mocked for caring more about his men's uniforms than about their military abilities. After joining a failed royal royalist plot to rescue a royal minister from prison, he fled to France, where he died in despair at the age of 33. His poems, though, preserve his dash and spirit of his younger days. Let's go ahead and turn now to the poem we'll be studying by Sir John Suckling's song, usually the most, of his, uh, most anthologized of his poems, at least at the high school level. Let's take a look now at this poem, and let's give a little bit of background just to make sure that we understand. In the previous two pairing poems, uh, the Marvel poem as well as the Herrick poem, the idea was to say to either the guy or to the girl, go for it. Okay, go for it. You should seize the day, the carpe diem theme. In this poem, we're going to get different maybe kind of advice to the guy who is interested in the girl. Let's take a look at the poem. We'll read it, and I'll ask you to see if you can figure out what the message here is. Go ahead and read with me on page 513. Song. Why so pale and wan, fond lover? Prithee, why so pale? Will, when looking well, couldn't move her, looking ill, prevail? Prithee, why so pale? Why so dull and mute, young sinner? Prithee, why so mute? Will, when speaking well, can't win her, say nothing to it? Prithee, why so mute? Quit, quit for shame. This will not move, this cannot take her. If of herself, she will not love. Nothing can make her. The devil take her. Now, uh, some reviewers of this poem have pointed out that maybe the single most important piece of this poem is that very last punctuation mark. That is to say, the exclamation mark that follows the words, the devil take her. And you can kind of begin to infer maybe a little bit about what's going on. Let's work at level one really quickly. Actually, let's start at 2B just for a moment. Notice, please, the form of this poem. Do you see that it is a three-stanza offering? Do you see this? 
In the first two stanzas, we're going to have some questions asked to an assumed would-be lover. And then, of course, in the final stanza, we're going to have some advice that will be given. That advice is in some ways the opposite of carpe diem, seize the day. In other words, at some point, dude, you've got to at least grow a brain and figure out this ain't happening for you. Let's take a look at the first stanza. Notice the question. The question, why so pale and wan? That is to say, looking really sickly, fond lover, Prithee, why so pale? Now, of course, this almost seems like an ironic question because it's obvious that whoever's asking this question already knows the answer, ergo the third stanza. In other words, this is almost like a friend asking you when he knows or she knows why you're so unhappy or upset, why are you so unhappy or upset? And she or he knows exactly why, and it has something to do with the fact that you are in love with someone and they won't return your texts, etc., etc. Notice the fact that the title of this poem is Song, and there's this kind of sing songy type of feeling in this poem. It's almost as if the speaker of the poem is laughing at the first notice fond lover in stanza one, and then young sinner in stanza two, right? Notice, why are you so pale? No, notice, and then notice what he says. Will, when looking well can't move her, looking ill prevail or work out? In other words, okay, dude, you tried this. You tried looking really, really good for her, and she said no, and wouldn't return your text. So why would walking around moping, sad, looking really sad, why would that make it work out for you? Notice, again, the prithee means please, uh, why so pale? Then the second stanza, um, why are you, why are you uh, refusing to talk? You know what I mean? Even back in 1600, when a guy was getting dumped by the girl or not getting texts returned, he would get really sullen and quiet, right? Notice here, why are you so dull? Why are you so mute you won't talk? Notice here, it's young sinner at this point. Why are you so mute? And then again, the same question. When you spoke all the time, will when speaking well can't win her? Say nothing? In other words, what, is this somehow supposed to get her? You talked a lot to her and she said no one would refer, return text. Now you're saying absolutely nothing and you're walking around like the whole world's on your shoulder. Is this what, is this supposed to convince her or something? Now the third stanza. Quit, quit, notice for shame. What do you imagine say, being said here? Right, don't embarrass yourself. Dude, you are embarrassing yourself now. Enough with it already. This will not move. Move her? Obviously her, right? Notice, this cannot take her. In other words, walking around all sad, walking around, you know, all quiet, walking around like you've lost the, the everything that matters in your life. Ah, let's jump to 3A really quickly. Of course, it's so interesting to realize that when Suckling wrote these lines, the most popular play coming out of the Globe Theater was Romeo and Juliet. Do you remember about Romeo when we first meet him? For the very first time when we meet him in that play, what is he doing? And what is it that his pal tells Romeo's mom and dad about Romeo? Every day, he locks himself in his room. He puts really sad songs on the, the record player and he listens and then he goes for this long walk out in the woods, heavy sighing. Why? The audience assumes it's because Romeo's in love with Juliet. Dude, that is the name of the play. No, Romeo doesn't even know Juliet exists. It's a girl named Rosaline, and he's so in love, and she won't respond to him. She won't return his texts, and he keeps, he keeps trying. And then finally, when she shoots him down, what does he do? He gets really dull and wan, and he gets really quiet and mute. You can almost get the sense that Suckling is responding, saying pretty much the same thing that Romeo's pal said to him, quit it for shame. This is not going to move her. This cannot take her. And notice, if of herself she will not love, nothing can make her, right? In other words, uh, you've tried. You got shot down. Leave it alone. And then finally, the last line, the devil take her, exclamation mark. In other words, bag it. She's not worth your time. She's not worth your energy. 
anyway. Of course, at 2A, it's pretty, pretty simple to write down a couple of messages or themes about this one, right? There has to be a moment when a guy needs to realize it's over and done. It isn't going to work out. Call it a day. Let's just call it what it is, man. This is not going to happen for you. This is not going to work out for you, right? Okay. At 2B, um, obviously, we've got any number of observations we've already made here. Notice again the kind of ironic questioning in the first two stanzas. Clearly the speaker who's asking, why are you so upset? Why are you looking this way? Why are you so quiet? He knows exactly why. What he wants to do is he wants to make his point. And his point is what? Dude, you got to know when to walk away. This is crazy. In other words, I understand carpe diem and seize the day and all of that, but you got to know when to draw the line and say enough is enough. Of course, at 3A, relationships to other titles, to other texts, lots and lots come to mind. We've already mentioned Romeo and Juliet, and you have that one written down. Ben Johnson's To Celia that we've studied earlier obviously plays the same kind of game. This question about a guy getting shot down, but he cannot accept it, and so he keeps trying against all of the odds. You're probably familiar with that famous Greek myth, Sisyphus, the myth of Sisyphus. Poor Sisyphus in the underworld. His punishment is to push this huge rock up a hill. And he works so hard and he works and he pushes it all the way up the hill. And he's almost got it over the top of the hill when he lets up for just a second and the rock rolls over him all the way back down to the bottom of the hill. <sighs> and then he goes all the way back down to the bottom of the hill and he starts pushing it up again and he pushes and he pushes and he pushes and he gets it all the way to the same spot and he's like yes I did it and he relaxes for just a split second and then the rock rolls back down over him again. The Greeks would use the myth of Sisyphus to talk about an insurmountable obstacle that for whatever reason you keep kind of trying, you keep kind of trying. Some of us were smiling as we think about, wow, that's the story of my life, actually. I keep trying to do something and I keep failing at it. And for some reason, I keep trying to do it over and over again. Of course, notice in this poem, you got the myth of Sisyphus meeting the whole paradigm of love. At what point should you know it's over? Stop pushing the rock up the hill. Obviously, we're playing that game at 3A as well, right? Let's go to 3B really quickly. Personal response to this. Without pulling out the tissue and breaking our heart all over again, are you at all able to write in your notes about a time when you could totally relate to this kind of, uh, this kind of poem? Either it's you personally, right? In other words, Looking backwards, you should have known this is not going to work out. But for some reason, you couldn't let it go. Some of us maybe are saying by our senior year, we have this experience several times in high school when you kind of recognize, oh, I was in code language. I was being told this ain't going to happen. There's no chance. But I was too young and stupid to understand that's what the code language was. And so I just kept going, kind of running my head into the wall over and over again. Of course, one other question at 3B that you can think about now and write about later. What is for you the moment when you know it's over? It's altogether possible that you know about relationships where they're very healthy and strong relationships, but the individuals in the relationships, one or the other or even both, will confide. There was a moment when, really, I thought it was totally over, and then I went ahead and kept trying, and then it worked out. Now, any story like that obviously leads to this then question of this poem. How do you know when finally you should walk away and just say it, the devil take her? In other words, I'm done, I'm over. And of course, is it ever over? In other words, does Romeo ever actually get over Rosaline until he sees Juliet? Hmm. Very interesting. The affairs of the heart. Well, there you go. An introduction to the Carpe Diem theme in reverse, right? Thank you.